Yeah. So now start. Yep. Okay. Good morning, Dr. Ken and all my friends. Today, my group topic is listening, taking notes, and remembering. My name is Ng Jun Shin, and this is Chris Cheng Chi Chun. This is Boy Chan Yin, and this is Kelvin Wun Jun Shang. <laughs> so now I'm going to start my, start my presentation. First, the college life is not the same as high school life or working life. I think the college life is a sector for, for us to discover the new social structures, such as we can make more friends, make more different kind of friends, and make ourselves into a different environment. The college life is very freedom, very, very freedom, and we can do whatever, whatever we want, and we may be invigorated by a new freedom. These differences are important because they might change our behavior if we want to be a successful student. Now, I'm going to talk about the differences between high school and college classes. Obviously, as we can see, uh, there are some differences between these two pictures. For example, the high school students must wear their school uniforms when they go to school. But the college students can wear whatever they want. And nobody is going to force them or send them to the discipline department. Okay. okay, never mind, never mind. Okay, here is the example uh, that the differences between the high school and college. In high school, there are many people that's going to guide us, such as our teachers or our parents. They will let us know when we are falling behind. But in the college, we must take responsibility to ourselves because everything is up to us. Um, next, our high school teachers will always take the attendance by themselves and they will take the attendance carefully. They will report to the school or our parents when, if we didn't go to the school. But in the college, we, we sign the attendance by ourselves and our, most of the lecturer will just expect us to attend the class. In high school, our teacher is just like our mother. Uh, they will always prepare the material that's going to use during the class for us and they will teach us when we are, when we are lost or cannot catch up the class. <laughs> but in the college, everything that we, we are going to use during, during the class, we must prepare by ourselves because our lecturer, eh, because nobody is going to help us and our lecturers is just hope we can understand the class. In high school, our teacher will always remind us what we should do or, or what homework that we have. And, uh, and uh, our teacher will always, will always write the assignment on the board and keep remind us to complete it. But in the college, everything is up to us. It is up to us to read. It is up to us to complete the assignment or hand in the assignment. And our, most of the lecturer will just really remind us about the assignment due dates. In high school, there are more class and lesser homework. Each class, we will have three to five, five times in a week, but a le with a lesser homework each night. But in the college, we have more assignment but lesser class. Just like this GE course, success strategy, we have, we have one self-journal and one quiz each week but we, we, just, we just have one class in a week. <laughs> Our high school teacher uh, well, are, are passionate everything about students. They were guiding their students and teaching them to learn. But our college, college lecturers are more passionate about their subject more than their teaching. 
but we can learn by asking questions, seeking advice during office hour and participating the class discussion. In high school, homeworks, assignment and quizzes are contribute heavy to our grades. Each credit opportunities to give students a chance to make up for lapses along the way. In college, our grades are determined by one or two exam or long-term projects such as presentation or group assignment. The, uh, the exam or presentation can just drag our grades down easily, so we must work on the assignment and complete the assignment as good as possible. In high school, most of the choices are made by our guidance or our, our parents and we were told what or when we should study, just like our teacher will tell us study early before the quiz. Mm, and we are followed by a predetermined curriculum, classes set by state or local officials. In high school, our parents or guidance have a major say in our elective choice. But in college, most of the choice is made by ourselves. We can choose the subject that we want to learn, just like our GE course. And because this is our education, not someone else. And I think this is, the, this is some way to become a successful person because we can find our passion in our university. Now, setting yourself up for success. The main point is, the most important point is identify the roles of listening and note taking in the learning circles. I, I believe most, most of us have some questions. It is how to study and how learning works. Most of the students have not learned how to study and don't understand how learning works. And this is the solution. So here is the solution, the circles of four steps, preparing, absorbing, capturing, and reviewing. This four point is the main point of learnings. At first, we must review the, the things that lecturer going to say uh, during the class, and we must, then we must prepare the materials that, that we need to use during the class. And during class, we must absorb new ideas while listening, and we must record down the points by taking notes with taking notes and memorizing <laughs> mm. okay so this is our group topic listening taking notes and remembering the listening skills is very important I, and i think it is a key skills for learning new materials if we have a good listening skills we can make us be a better note takers and taking good notes can help us listen better. Taking good, and taking good notes is also very important because it, or it is an uh, important skill in the capturing phrase of the circles. Both of these listening skills and taking notes are, in, are the key study skills to help us do better in our classes. So this topic is, are you ready for classes? Are you ready for class? Mm. I think a good athlete, a professional athlete won't, won't play a match without warming up and just like a successful student, they won't attend a class without preparing for it. All we need is to get ourselves in the right frame of mind. This does not take a lot of time but it will increase your ability to listen and take good notes. <laughs> Here is an example. A successful, a successful student will always ask themselves some questions. They will ask themselves, what do I want to get from the class? What is the main idea that the class cover? And how will, the, how will today's class help us do better in the course? And I think a successful student must, uh, will be very confident to themselves so this is the confidence student will do. They will complete the assignment that the instructor gave in the last class. 
and they will think about how today material will ties into what you have already learned. And they will review the course syllabus to see what the instructor accept, expect the, to cover in the class. And this is the way to be a confident person. We must have enough sleep and having nutrition meals during our breakfast, lunch or dinner because it is hard to focus while we are hungry and we must prepare all the material that we need for class such as paper, pens, laptop and textbooks. The most, the lastly, lastly, we must clear away all other distractions before the instructor start the class. Let's see. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris. Now I'm going to talk about how ability for listening. Mm. As we know, listening is very important for the class environment and the job. Uh, for example, if your boss uh, wants you, want you to do something, if you are not listen carefully what he wants you to do, uh, I think you will have to continue. In here, I will, I will give you some suggestions about how to ask a good question and how a properly suggested that meant listening. Firstly, Effective listening is one of the important learning tools you can have in the college. As we know, in the college, we must listen to the lecturer if uh, in the class they, um, some of them they'll just, uh, talk, uh, just say the point they will not write down and they are not write it on the slide, so we must listen carefully to them. And they will, make, they will benefit you on the job and help your relationship with others. And then listening is not nothing more than purposefully focuses on what a speaker is saying with the subjective understanding. Uh, in here, I would like to share uh, the principles of active listening. The first one is focus on what is being said. Uh, uh, you, Thus, you need to focus on what is the lecturer is going to say. Because um, uh, if you want the uh, listener, uh, lecturer repeat the question or the subject to you, I think it's impossible. Uh, it, uh, and then you need to clear your mind or uh, anything else. If you, um, if you are not, uh, for example, if the lecturer is talking and you thinking about other things, for example. Uh, uh, if the uh, lecturer is talking about chicken, then you think about the KFC, they are, they are not able to learn anything in the class. And next one is repeat what you just heard. Mm, just make sure what you just heard and, and try to remember, remember it as well as possible. And the next one is if you are unsure you understand, just ask the question. Mm, if you don't ask the question and you don't understand, understand uh, the question is, uh, I feel you, you cannot un understand what the lecturer is talking about, then you are hard to learn anything. Uh, for example, uh, last, like the uh, uh, data analyst, uh, I always don't like, don't like to ask questions. I just ask my friend that uh, they also, my friend uh, also don't ask that, understand that question, so um, I had to learn anything from here. Uh. And the next one is look for November site. Uh, singer as well as the word use. Confirm this body language message just as you will ever message uh, saying. Uh, some of the lecturers, I think they, um, they have a lot of the body language. Um, um, uh, they will, sometimes we look at their body language and listening what is they said, uh, they will uh, just easily, we can easily to remember what is, just easy to remember Rina. <laughs> And the next one is a speaker will often hide a request as a statement of a problem. Some, sometimes uh, the somebody will just um, they will not tell you they have a problem. They use a different way to tell you. For example, like my friend, they, he tell me he don't like maths. Uh, I think I know he I, he want to I he want I tell you to solve the eh, just help. he want I teach the maths to you, but I also don't know how to do it. Uh, next. 
Uh, here I would like to share how to make the uh, how to make listening and lecture a more effective and learning more fun. The firstly is the first thing is get your mind in the right 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 space. Just like how I said just now, just um, clear your mind first and then focus on the class, listening what is lecturer talking about and try to thinking about the question. And the next one is get yourself in the right space. Uh, just um, try to sit in, in the class as close to the lecturer as close as possible. Uh, we can, you can easily do con uh, connecting with the lecturer and also you ask the question as easily. La. And the next one is focus on, focus on what is being to say. Um, Listening to the lecturer who is talking about, and then turn off your cell phone and put it in your bed. Uh, don't let it, don't let your phone disturb your learning, and then just try to. Uh, if you is your friend talking to you, like you just try to don't listen to him, just listen to the lecturer. And next one is look of, look for the singer. Uh, each instructor have a different way of telling you what is important. Some of the, some of the instructor have uh, they may repeat the important point important point three or four times. They, they they just want to tell you what is the point is important. And some of them they just a uh, a uh, turn a uh, raise your voice, every raise their voice, and some of them will. Um, I just write the point on the whiteboard. They just want to tell you what is the important point. And next one is listen, listen for what is not being said. Um, some of the lecturer they they does not cover cover the subject or covers or uh, only mi mi minimally. They miss the what is not that. Next one is all the information. Decide what is important and what is not. What is clear and what is not. What is confusing and what is new. The what is the new idea and what is not. That, uh, this will help you how to make a, um, a good note and also you are easy to learn something from the class. And the next one is take notes. Uh, we in the in, I think in the university. University, we are normally make a note in the class, uh, and then it will help you to uh, easily to review, just do the revision. Uh. And the last one is ask question. If you don't understand, just ask, <laughs> because you never ask, you never know. And the next one is dealing with special listening challenge. Um, I would like to show you. What to do if you cannot hear carefully? Eh, hear clearly to the lecturer. Uh, if your instructor speak not fa speak too fast, uh, I think you just crack up with your preparation. Just try to understand what is the subject about, and then try to. You, you might also try to in visit the instructor during the uh, after the class, uh, and then. Also, you can ask the lecturer try to speak slowly. Uh, you need to ask properly as possible. <laughs> okay. And the uh, next one, if your instructor have a heavy a sense, uh, I think in this situation, you just can uh, ask, sit as close to the instructor as possible. Uh, because you need to hear very, you need to listen in very clearly and try to learn something from it. And if you really hard to listen to what the teacher is talking about, you, you also can try to visit the in the in after the class. And next one is, if your instructor speaks slow, slow, softly or mumbles, and uh, also <laughs> sit close to the uh, instructor as possible and try to make uh, eyes content, uh, you, sometimes you, okay, if you have a problem, just ask. Uh, just like how I say just now. 
next uh, how to make a good how to ask a good question mm. I hope I, hope I say just now if you have a question just ask but after before we ask the question we need to think how to make how to I make a good question don't make just don't make a, a question very uh, nothing to nothing to answer la. the first thing is uh, try to be prepared just prepare uh, what, what are the things we need to ask and how to ask and the next one is position yourself in for success sit nearly from in the class and it will make easier make a uh, ice content with the lecturer and also we will we you will not uh you, you won't be imit, imit, intimately by a class full of her turning the start at you ask you ask you ask your question and the next one is don't wait that means uh uh, uh if your lecturer talking something talking something you don't understand you must ask now because after after it you maybe you don't understand what you want what i want to ask just now uh. <laughs> and the next one is in the lecturer class write your question down mm, just like how i said just now if the teacher when you ask after the class you write down the question and try to think how, how you want to ask uh. and the next one is ask the spe spe uh, spe specific question mm, just like how i said just now don't ask the boring question and don't ask question for you for the question for the for the just for me uh. and then mm, if you ask a special question uh, the lecturer will also easy to remember you uh, this case is not easy uh. And then um, the last one is don't ask question for the sake of asking question. Um, okay, that's all. Now I want to pass it to my friend. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Boi Zhang Yin. And after learning to listen, note taking is the most important skill to ensure your success in a class. As mentioned earlier, college was different from high school, so we need to put in effort to success. So why taking notes are important to us? Taking notes are important because it can support your listening efforts. Next, it can allow you to test your understanding of the material, then helps you remember the material better when you write key ideas down and give you a sense of what the instructor Things is important and creates your ultimate study guide. After knowing how important is taking notes, now I want to talk about four primary methods of taking notes. List, outline, concept map, and Cornell method. First, the list method. Most students use as a fallback if they haven't learned other methods. This me method typically requires a lot of writing and you may find it that you are not keeping up with the professor. It is not easy for students to prioritize ideas in this method. Focus exclusively on capturing as much of what the instructor says as possible. And the second method is outline method. A good method to use when material presented by the instructor is well organized. Easy to use when taking notes on your computer. And the advantage of the outline method is that it allows you to prioritize the material compared to the list method. Next is the concept map method. A good method to use when material presented by the instructor is well organized, easy to use when taking notes on your computer, and the advantage. Oh, sorry. The concept map method. When designing a concept map, place a central idea in the center of the page and then add lines and new circles in the page for new ideas. Use arrow and lines to connect the various ideas. And it can harness your visual sense to understand complex material at a glance. And it also gives you the flexibility to move from one idea to another and back easily.
And the last method is Cornell method. The Cornell method follows a very specific format that consists of four boxes, a header, two columns, and a footer. First, review your notes and write the key ideas and concept or question in the left column. You may also include a summary box at the bottom of the page in which to write a summary of a class or reading in your own words. The right column is used for taking notes using any of the methods described above or a combination of them. It is simple to use for capturing notes, is helpful for defining priorities, and is a very helpful study tool. So after introduce four methods for taking notes, I believe that you all have an idea of these four methods and knew which suitable for your most. For more details, you can also refer to College Success textbook. And then next, the instructor handouts. Some instructor hand out or post their notes and their PowerPoint slide from their lectures. These handouts should never be considered as a substitute for taking notes in class. They are very useful, complement, and will help you confirm the accuracy of your notes, but they do not involve you in the process of learning as well as your own notes do. So now I will talk about some general tips on note taking. First, we need to be prepared. Make sure you have a tools you need to do the job. Secondly, write on only one side of the paper. This will allow you to integrate your reading notes with your class notes. Then, label, number, and date or notes at the top of each page. When using a laptop, position it such that you can see the instructor and whiteboard right over your screen. Next, don't try to capture everything that is said. We should listen for the big idea and write them down. And the next one is copy anything the instructor writes on the board. It seems to be important. Then leave space between ideas. This allows you to add additional notes later. And using signal and abbreviations. Use some method for identifying your own thoughts and questions to keep them separate from what the instructor or textbook author is saying. Create a symbol to use when you fall behind. Review your notes as soon as after class as possible. And lastly, write a summary of the main ideas of the class in your own words. And what if you miss a class? This is a common thing in college because some of us may sleep very late and or taking a nap and miss a class. Therefore, this us few ways for this situation. First, you can check with the instructor to see if there is another section of the class you can attend. If the instructor posts his or her lectures as a podcast, listen to the lecture online and take notes. If the instructor uses PowerPoint slides, request a copy or download them and review them carefully, jotting down your own notes and questions. And lastly, review your notes with a classmate who did attend. And borrow class notes from a classmate. And don't just copy them and insert them in your notebook. This will not be very helpful. When you borrow notes from a classmate, you should photocopy them and then review them carefully and mark your copy with your own notes and questions. Use your textbook to try to fill in the gaps. And last, use the course slippers to determine what was covered in the class. Then write a short paper on the material using the class readings and reliable online sources. For keeping notes, first we can start by organizing your notes, group all notes from a class or unit together in a section. This includes class notes, reading notes, and instructor handouts. And next, we need to spend some time linking the information across the various notes and link the related information in other notes. And lastly, write notes on your notes. Review your summary to see if it still is valid in light of your notes on the reading and any hands up you may have added to your notes package. Lastly, you may want to keep your notes that can help you in the future like some following cases. If the course you took is a prerequisite for another course, or when the course is part of standard progression of courses that build upon each other. This is a very common in math and science course. You should keep them as a reference and review for the follow-up course. 
And second, if you are very interested in the course subject and would like to get into the material through a more advanced course, independent study or even research, you can also keep your notes. And lastly, if the course you took If you are very interested in the course subject and would like to get into the material through a more advanced course, independent study, keep your notes as a preparation tool for further work. And some of you may like to take notes on your phones or laptop, so these are a few of famous note-taking apps nowadays. And now I will pass to Kevin. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Kevin. Today I'm going to talking about remembering course materials. Uh, first, learning objectives. We need to identify what is important to remember, and second, understand the difference between short and long term memory, and then use a var variety of strategies to build your memory power. And fourth, identify the four key types of mnemonic devices. And the last, use mnemonics to remember list of information. The role of memorization in learning is very important. Memory fails everyone from time to time, especially to students. They have a harsh amount of information they must commit to memory, are often frustrated by their memory. By listening effectively and taking notes, your job is to distill the main ideas and a few keywords. These are the things you should choose to memorize in your early and high school education, memorization was a key aspect of learning. Memorize first and ensure your success on multiple choice questions. Understanding themes and ideas and being able to think critically about them is really the key to your success in learning. Although memorization is not the primary key to success, Having a good memory is important to capture ideas in your mind. And it helps tremendously in certain subjects like science and foreign language. And how memory works. Make a deliberate decision to remember the specific data and link the information to your everyday life. Ask yourself why is it important that I remember this material and answer it. Then link the information to other information you already have stored. And Mentally group similar individual items into buckets. By doing this, you are creating lines, links, for example, among terms to be memorized. And use visual imagery vividly in your mind. Then use the information. Then Break information down into manageable chunks. Work from general information to the specified, specific. Sorry. Eliminate distractions and repeat, repeat, repeat. The more you use or repeat the information, the stronger the links to it, the more sense you use to process the information, the stronger the memorization. And 
Memory disk is a test, test your memory often, therefore you can remember it. The last, location, location, location. There's often a strong connection between information and the place where you first received that information. Next, I'm um, using mnemonics. Mnemonics are tricks for memorizing lists and data. They create artificial but strong links to the data, making recall easier. The most commonly used mnemonic device are acronyms, acrotics, remnants, and jingles. Jingles are phrases set to music so that the music helps trigger your memory. Jingles are more commonly used by advertisers to get you to remember their product and product features. Anytime you add random to the terms you want to memorize, you are activating your auditory sense and the more senses you use for memorization, the stronger the links to the data you are creating in your mind. Creative memory challenge um, is a very inter interesting. Create an acrostic to remember the noble gases helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and the radioactive radon. Create an acronym to remember the names of the eight group of countries, France, the United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, Germany, Japan, Italy, and Canada. Mnemonics are group memory aids, but they aren't perfect. They take a lot of effort to develop, and they also take terms out of context because they don't focus on the meaning of the words. Since they lack meaning, they can also be easy forgotten later on, although you may remember them through the course. Thank you. This is the end of our presentation. And now I'm going to ask some questions. The first question, which one is the fourth stage of learning? The answer is A. O answer the one, preparing. The second, absorbing. Third, capturing. And last, reviewing. The second question, how to learn and memorize things faster? The answer is A. Exercise to clear your head. Teach other people what you learn. And the third, write down what needs to be memorized over and over. The third question, how to make listening to lecturers most effective and learning more fun? Answers also the A. The first focus on what is being said. The second get your mind in the right space. And the third sleeping in class. Hey, sorry. Uh, wait. Look for Sina. So so now is the the fourth questions. Which of the methods of note taking consists for of four boxes, a head, a header, two columns, and a footer? The answer is A, the Cornell method. <laughs> the fifth question is which of the following options are the tips for taking notes? The answer is A, be prepared. Write on only one side of the paper and copy anything the instructor writes on the board. On the board. For the question six, which method focuses exclusively on the capturing as much of what the instructor says as possible and not on processing the information? And the answer is A, the least method. Next, the last question, what is the sequence for keeping your notes? 
The answer is also A. Organizing your notes, write notes on your notes, and linking the information across the various notes. Any questions? Thank you, thank you. So this is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just a few comments on the uh, student presentation today. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I kind of covered, um, oh, by the way, I would, I would urge all groups to look at the material very carefully and, and again, try to figure out exactly what's most important you're going to present and emphasize that better. Um, if you try to cover too much, uh, then you cover nothing really well. And, and so, cover less stuff and, and make more slides, make more illustration, more examples, explain it better. Um, that's, again, my, my emphasis on it. Um, and so, actually, in a way, I'm saying do less work. Uh, just, uh, again, maybe that's a little bit facetious, because to do it better uh, may take just as much work. But uh, just uh, try, to, try to maybe cover a little bit less and, and cover it. For example, if you have uh, you know, several uh, uh, types of note taking, maybe cover some of them less because they're so common and spend a little more time on the one that is considered the best and maybe teach that to us since we don't know it maybe yet, that sort of thing. But just uh, try to figure out what's most important, what people should benefit from the most and try to emphasize that. Um, anyway, uh, more specifically, things I wanted to uh, uh, mention. I actually use the least effective method of note taking, <clears throat> which is probably good because I became a journalist, and a journalist has to take as good a notes as, as as specific a notes as possible. And so my my classroom note taking mirrored my journalistic note taking. Um, in journalism, we we basically teach people to listen and and try to figure out what's most important because they can't take, uh, they don't, uh, uh, they don't have time to take down everything, that's true. Um, so they have to figure out what's most important and so they're doing some editing even at the time that they're doing their listening. What is it that's really important and write that down. Uh, but another aspect to it is uh, I, I teach my journalism students to also take time after they're done taking their notes to go through and try to remember the things they didn't take notes on, uh, that they didn't have time to take notes on. And still what they have on their, on their paper, maybe they wrote down one or two words, but they didn't really explain it very well. But if they sit down as soon as possible after their class, they can fill in some more information. And uh, so I know that there's one uh, reporter from the New York Times who I interviewed who has won a lot of prizes and stuff. And he's actually put people in jail, in prison, with his reporting. Um, and because of the type of reporting he does uh, with people that, you know, don't want to tell the truth, uh, he has certain specific things that he does. And, and I won't go through all of his methods since that's not, uh, we're not, you're not journalism students. But one of the things he does is he does not take notes at all. Uh, he, he just tries to remember everything, the most important stuff uh, because he's thinking if he's trying to get somebody to confess, basically, confess to a crime, that they're not going to confess very, very, uh, very much if, they're, if he's taking notes in front of them uh, or if he has a tape recorder in front of them. They're not going to confess anything. Now, actually, I found that I have had people confess stuff to me uh, on a, with a tape recorder running. So I think he's somewhat wrong sometimes. Uh, but nonetheless, forgetting about whether he's right or wrong with the method, he does exactly what I was just saying. He, does, he, he takes, in his case, he takes no notes, but as soon as he leaves the interview, he finds a quiet place uh, in the stairwell or wherever he can find, and he spends uh, 30 minutes writing down everything he can remember. 
Um, now, like I said, I don't, even in my journalistic work, I do not do, try to do what he does. And I found that actually criminals are quite stupid, uh, that they will sometimes uh, say stuff that they regret later, even with the tape recorder running, with the audio recorder running. Uh, I've gotten two mayors kicked out of office because they said stuff they shouldn't have said, and I had an audio recorder running for them. And another, another gal, another politician, uh, likewise tried to deny what she, what she told me, and I had the recording of her. Um, other people who have also, you know, done unethical or criminal activities, I have on video recorder, or an audio recorder, I mean. So, um, I actually use the audio, audio recorder and take quite a, quite a, well, actually what I find is that if I turn on the audio recorder, I can kind of accomplish, accomplish what this New York Times reporter does, is I can take fewer notes and I can look the guy eye to eye and talk to him like we're friends, and he for, totally forgets about the audio recorder. Uh, so it's kind of strange that way. Um, taking notes, however, does sometimes interrupt the conversation. So sometimes I do kind of like what he does. Even though I have an audio recorder running, I don't want to have to listen to the whole recording again. And so I also fill in a lot of my note taking when I'm done doing an interview uh, as kind of a table of contents to what I, what I uh, have actually in an audio recorder, so I don't have to try to transcribe it. I don't want to have to do that because I'm in a hurry to get my job done. So anyway, the point is, is if you take some time, if you have some time uh, right after a class, take that time and, and expand your notes. Uh, the other thing, just to emphasize the importance of notes, I may have mentioned in this class before, but it's actually a type of, it's a learning method the more you write something, the more you mem remember it. You know, you, the typical person is learning uh, in a classroom uh, visually and in, and in auditory, but writing is also, that's kinesthetic learning. And if you're trying to learn a new language, you should be writing new words. You might take a, you know, every week decide you're gonna learn 20 new words, and you write each of those 20 words maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 times. You'll remember those words. You can't write it that often without remembering it. And so kinesthetic learning is, is an important type of learning and it starts with note taking, but that may not be the end of it. Um, it talks, they talk about organizing uh, your notes later. What I do, what I've done to have, I had you know straight A's in my master's work, almost straight A's in my in my uh, bachelor's work, straight A's in my doctoral work. Um, and so I'm, I know how to play the system, so to speak. Uh, that doesn't make me the smartest person in the world, it just means I have figured out the, the, the method. And uh, so one thing I do is uh, before a, a, a major exam, whether it's midterm or final exam, I do go back to all my notes and rewrite all the notes on, on cards, on, uh, like uh, we call them three by five cards or four by five cards, a little bit heavier stock that you might put into a file. Uh, we use them for debate and things also. So a, a card about that big and write, rewrite all of everything that I think is important. So I've, I've taken my daily notes now before the final or, the, or a major exam, I'm going through and I'm rewriting all my notes, again, learning kinesthetically, but also analyzing what I think is important uh, by the way, in the original listening, it kind of relates to what Dr. Covey was saying. How are you listening to the professor? Uh, I urge my children and I urge my students to listen, uh, I guess you could say it empathetically, to listen psychologically, uh, to try to figure out what's important to that professor because he, he, he reveals himself when he talks to you. He reveals what he thinks is important. And so what he is important to him is likely to end up in your exam. And so over a period of time, you can start figuring out how he thinks. Um, you certainly need to listen you know, to things like you know, how he's gonna grade you, what his criteria is gonna be. And you can figure that out better too if you're listening somewhat empathetically, psychologically, however you wanna call it, you're trying to get into his brain. How does he think? because that reveals to you how he would do exams. Um, and so get into his head. 
Um, so I'm also thinking that way as I redo the notes in preparation for the exam. Uh, one thing I do that is not like what they tell you in the book. Uh, normally, I want I get a good night's sleep. Uh, to me, uh, they they have by the way they figured out that that in your sleep you go your sleep cycle is in about one about 90 minute cycles, and so you go into a dream cycle, you come back out of it, you go into a dream cycle, back out of it, back into the dream cycle, and each dream cycle is about 90 minutes or at least the whole cycle is in about 90 minutes. And so what they found is that if you wake up in between cycles, you're still gonna feel tired. And so uh, four and a half hours, for example, would be three, three cycles. And you could actually probably get by pretty well in four and a half hours as long as you woke up, you know, found out, figured out, if, if, you know, it might, yours might vary a little bit, but by and large, they find it's, it's 90 minute cycles. So three 90 minute cycles, four and a half hours, you will feel somewhat refreshed. Um, I go for six hours, but I automatically wake up in six hours. Um, and I, you know, that's not to say I never feel tired during the day, but I, if I get my full six hours and wake up on the six hour mark, I'm fine. Um, I also use, we we're talking about programming your mind. I think I mentioned this before. I will program my mind to wake up in six hours. So it's pretty much knows, my mind knows I'm, I'm a six hour sleeper and in six hours it wakes me up. Um, and I don't know, I no longer have to program it because I've been programming it all my life. And it knows six hours, time to get him up and up he goes. Um, the, uh, but when it comes to an exam and maybe, may, I don't know if you can teach yourself this or not, but my response to an exam is like a bear chasing me. Um, I let my, my adrenaline takes over when I'm facing an exam. And again, maybe, I don't know if you can teach yourself that, but to me, I can very easily stay up most of the night studying uh, because I have the adrenaline going. I have the bear chasing me. And so if I have a major exam um, and it's not gonna hurt my other stuff, yeah, I'll stay up essentially all night studying, rewriting my notes, reviewing my notes, and again, a reason why I'm putting them on three by five cards or you know, some, some, some way of, of that I can take a look at them, look at them over and over again. Um, in my master's program, everybody told me that the hardest class was the research class. And so I considered it a big bear. <laughs> I was scared of that bear catching me. Um, I, I felt strongly that I needed to do well in my classes and I had been out in the real world for a few years. So I'd been away from academia. I wasn't sure you know, what bad habits I might have picked up, that I wasn't used to studying anymore, things like that. And so I came back and using this method I'm talking about, I stayed up all night, you know, rewriting my notes, organizing my notes, reviewing those note cards uh, multiple times, uh, having already outsiked the professor as best I could. And uh, in that class, uh, there was a, I remember there was 181 points possible in that class. Um, I got 179 points, and the second highest was 126. So basically, I got 50% more points than the second highest person in the class using this method. But I don't know that you can, I don't know that you can teach yourself that. But I, I maybe you can. I don't know. But to me, the exam's a bear, and that sets off my adrenaline, and I can stay up all night studying, in order to beat the bear, and. Uh, and get the, the, the kind of score I want. So I know the book says don't do that. And I'd say if it's hard for you to do that, then don't do it. To me, it's not hard to do it. It's to, to me, it's not hard to study all night if I'm scared that I'm not gonna do well. Uh, I can do it because I have adrenaline, uh, putting that extra energy into my body. Um, so if you can somehow fabricate that bear, imagine that bear coming after you and you have the adrenaline to keep studying, uh, what can I say? You know, to get 50% better than the second person, I think, is an example. And it's not that I have a, you know, some sort of an incredible memory. I have just a normal memory, I, th I think. I just have learned methods to implement, you know, to activate my memory and, and make it more functional. 
Okay. Well, let's uh, go into this a little bit. I'm going to end class a little bit early today. Uh, one of those sounds you hear in the background, are, I'm going to give a, a uh, lecture on marketing to uh, a bunch of people gathered in Almaty, Kazakhstan, and I'm doing it over the internet. And so they're trying, they want me to test the internet connection, and I had already told them that it would be a little bit later, but nonetheless, I'm going to try to cover my topic here in uh, very short order, um, and maybe do better when you come back and add, a, add a, you know, cover some of this uh, again. Because um, one thing we didn't cover at all last week. Uh, so I've added a little bit to this week's from last week. Um, I went ahead and we listened to a couple of these uh, videos again uh, before class even, I started playing these before class even began. The empathetic learning uh, is, is the highest level of learning where you're trying to listen with your uh, with your heart, with your, uh, you're trying to get into their head, as I was saying earlier. So you're trying to understand them. That is your first priority to truly understand them, not just, uh, you know, make them happy, not be thinking how you're going to respond to them all the time. Oh, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to respond this way. That's not really trying to understand them if you're thinking about how you're going to sound smart when they're done talking. Uh, that's looking at it totally from your perspective. Uh, he talked about one way of doing that was with the, he had talked about his uh, Indian stick or whatever you called that, where the, the point was that you can't, uh, that you, somebody else has the stick and he said you can use a spoon or a straw or anything, it doesn't matter, but in this case that a, a, an Indian tribe gave him this stick and the idea was that whoever has the stick does not give up the stick until he feels understood. And so in other words, He's going to keep talking until you really show him with your body language and maybe responding and asking questions and so forth that you really understand his, his point of view. And then he'll give you the stick and he can't say, he can't say anything other than questions and reflections. He can't give his own opinion until you're done and you feel understood. And you keep the stick going back and forth until you both feel like you've fully understood the entire situation and can... Uh, uh, walk away uh, from that discussion feeling understood, if not in agreement. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be in agreement. Um, and in fact, as Dr. Covey talks about this idea of win-win, again, these ideas merge. Uh, first off, the idea of win-win, uh, and the second idea I mentioned last week of uh, seek first to understand, then to be understood, are so merged together that it's hard to separate them. Uh, they are separate principles, but they're totally, in, you know, I uh, intertwined. Uh, because you can't come up to a win-win situation unless you are a, a, an empathetic learner, uh, an em empathetic listener, until until it is your priority to truly understand the other side. If you're not trying to understand the other side, then it's going to be much harder for you to come up with a win-win situation. You have to seek. You have to understand before you can be understood. Uh, so that becomes a key, those two principles become very much intermeshed uh, together. The, uh, and so there's some additional videos for you all to listen to uh, on this subject. I'm not gonna listen to them in class, we don't have time today. Um, and um, I don't think I have that many assigned for, uh, for this. Your, your uh, quiz, by the way, will be the Wednesday after you come back, so uh, you'll have some time uh, to listen to the video to the videos and and uh, the Indian talking stick they call it. Um, okay, so I'm going to I think because of the limited time we have, I, I think we covered win win adequately. If I do feel like we need to cover it a little more, I'll cover it when you come back and and try to pick it up there. Um, but I, I think we understand it well enough that I, I want to go on and spend this few minutes uh, about, um, about this idea of seek first to understand and cover that a little better. Um, he kind of reflected it with, with the, one of his examples where he's talking to a father and the father said, I don't understand my son, you won't listen to me. I mean, that's obviously a total contradiction. Uh, if you don't understand your son, you need to listen to him. 
one of the things that Dr. Covey mentioned, and he did mention in the video we were listening to as we started class, is that truly listening to somebody is a very disarming function. It makes them feel uh, a, a social acceptance uh, that you are that you care enough about them to understand that it's a very uh, I'm, what's the right word? Um, well, it just it makes them feel accepted, makes them feel like like uh, you are friends. Um, and so in so doing, like I said, actually, as a journalist, we we have to pretend that way, even if we know we're going to try to put somebody. I mean, we 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 understand somebody's going to go to prison in this thing or something major is going to happen to them. So you can pretend. Uh, but in a sense, you're not really pretending because you are really trying to listen to understand. And that is such an enabling factor that in some cases, these politicians and stuff will say stuff they should absolutely not say because they, they want you to understand them. And so they're telling you stuff. You need a lawyer, friend. You, know, you, you should not be telling me this stuff because your job as a journalist is to report it. And so they somehow, the very fact that you're listening to them intently and then emp empathetically actually is their undoing. Because just because you're listening to them empathetically as a journalist doesn't mean you're going to be their friend because you have a job. But put yourself in a business situation where you're not, your job is not to tell the truth. Uh, now this, this uh, listening empathetically is very empowering. I guess that's the word I was looking for a second ago, very empowering. Uh, and so if you take the time, as you, if you sit down in negotiations and you take the time to really understand where they're coming from, two things happen. First off, they start trusting you. They start feeling like that if you're really willing to understand them, you're somebody that they can work with. Um, and, and secondly, once you've done that, you actually don't need a talking stick. It is very natural thing that once they feel understood, it is very natural for them to then want to understand. And so if you're talking to, you know, if you're, when you become parents and you're talking to your son who's been doing something stupid at, at school, or maybe he comes to you, I think one of the examples in the book is your son comes to you and says, dad, I wanna drop out of school. I, I wanna, you know, maybe become a mechanic or something. I just don't feel, I'm not happy at school. Well, now instead of yelling at him, say, what kind of idiot are you? You know, you've had all these opportunities and here's this opportunity to learn, get more knowledge and go on to university and become anything you want to in the world. And you say you want to drop out of high school. Are you crazy? Well, what's that do immediately? Okay, I'm ready to fight. <laughs> okay, your son's going to fight you. If you're going to tell him he's crazy for wanting to drop out of school. But if you say, I understand that you're really upset about something and you're not happy. I want you to be happy. So what's going on? Explain it to me. What's going on at school that you hate so much that you want to drop out? And now if you really listen and ask probing questions to try to find out what it is that's making him want to drop out of school, at some point he's going to kind of reveal maybe there's something you can fix. Um, Maybe there's, he needs to go to another school, who knows? But at some point, once he feels understood, is a very natural thing for that son then to say, at some point when he feels totally understood, what do you think, Dad? What do you think I should do? And now he's ready to listen and let you to be understood. And that's true in a business situation as well, that when they feel understood, they actually want to know. They want to understand you because now that you've empowered them, they actually want to empower you. And so you rarely, you really most frequently do not need a talking stick to do this. As long as you take the first step and you listen and ask questions and, are, and make them feel understood. Once they feel understood, they feel very naturally want to understand you. And they won't feel threatened by you. Why won't they feel threatened by you? Because you've taken time to care and cared enough to listen to them. And therefore, they no longer feel threatened. 
if they walk in and the first thing you do is, you, what kind of idiot are you, <laughs> or whatever, now are they going to not feel threatened by you? Obviously, you, you've just threatened them. You just called them a name. You just, uh, you know, whatever. You, you've now not empowered them. Just to the contrary, you belittled them. Uh, and so are they anxious to hear more from you? No. They don't, they're not anxious to hear more from you anymore. Uh, so this is a very important principle, whether or not you're, uh, in, you're work, dealing with somebody in your family or dealing with somebody in business, doing negotiations. It's, it, it's vital that you understand this principle of communication. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. The other way of looking at it, he says, is like you go to a doctor. And maybe some of you have gone to some doctors like I have that you go in and they're busy and they have lots of people. There's a cold going around and you hardly say anything and say, yeah, well, I'll take some cold medicine. See you later. You know, they have not asked for all of your symptoms. They've asked for some symptoms, maybe. And because they are already predisposed to think, oh, there's a cold going around, they immediately say, give you cold medicine. And yet, maybe there's some symptoms they didn't listen to. Um, and, and so you feel like you've been cheated. You've been sitting in the waiting room waiting for the doctor for hours, for an hour, and they, they talk to you for about five minutes and walk out the room and you know, tell you what to do. Um, I happen to have a doctor in America that sits down and he has his, all of his rooms, uh, his patient rooms are all uh, uh, tied to the uh, one network. And so he comes in with his laptop and he said, okay, let me review where we were last time, Ken. And he starts asking me questions. He's typing away. And he'll spend at least 30 minutes updating his notes right then and there with his laptop. Now, one thing that does is that means he doesn't stay at night filling out his reports because he's filling them out right then with you. And he's asking you, is, okay, do I understand, you know, how you're feeling? Do you, is there anything else you need to tell me? And so after half an hour of him taking notes, I feel like he well understands me. Um, and so I've had this same doctor for 30 years. So it's not him that I'm concerned about, it's other doctors when I go someplace else, because this doctor understands me. He has a computer filled with my information and he updates it very thoroughly every time I see him. Um, and so do I trust him? Absolutely, I, when, he, when he says, okay, this is what I think you need to do, Ken, because I've been understood, um, I, I'm listening to his, you know, his diagnosis and his prescription uh, because he's, he's understood me. He's taken the time to understand me. And so we can do similarly, whether it's in our family, that basically we're acting that we're going to be the doctor. And for us to, to, to prescribe a solution to our son wanting to drop out of school or to a business uh, employee who is not uh, performing properly or whatever it is, we need to be that doctor who listens to all the listens to all the complaints. And then they will be ready to listen to our prescription. So we do the diagnosis before we prescribe. So that's really the key to it. Now there's a ways of applying it in the real world. There's a, a program in selling high value products. This was actually created for engineering, for selling engineering uh, consulting services. Uh, some of my marketing work was done for, for two different corporations uh, that were consulting firms. And so this was a, a method that uh, was developed specifically for that. So some of our jobs were, you know, to get a new client might be worth a million dollars eventually. Uh, if they, especially if like, like a school, a school district that built um, a new school every few years, and we got to do the design work for their their school, well, that was worth a lot of money to us, and so it was worth taking time to sit down with them and really understand where their what their needs were, um, and so that's basically again uh, you can use this actually in the sales world, where you go in and you say my purpose today is to understand what. Uh, your situation is, what your goals are, what obstacles you're facing, uh, what uh, your vision for the future is, and you go through and you just ask question after question after question 
until they feel fully understood. And then when you're done, I'm not going to go through all these slides, but when you're all done, you do ask, just like my doctor does, is there anything I don't understand? You, you, repeat, you, you take your notes and you repeat uh, back to them what you think you understand and what they told you, what their goals are, their problems are, all this sort of stuff. And, and then, okay, this is what I understand. Am I leaving anything out? And so you take some additional notes if they think that you're leaving something out or if it just something new came to their mind, which frequently happens. And so then uh, in the case of big ticket items like uh, engineering services, you don't even give them a, a, a prescription yet. You say, you know what, we have a team of specialists back in our company. And I'd like to take these notes back to the company and review your situation and come back with a very specific uh, proposal for you on how your situation can be, can be handled. And I, but I, like I said, I'd like the input of our specialist. And so now it's like, you know, your doctor is saying, well, I need to go talk to the cancer doctor and the, you know, all these other people uh, to make sure I give you the right prescription. Um, and when you come back, a couple of things will have happened. Just like your empathetic learning or your empathetic listening that I was talking about before, they feel understood already before you even come back again because you have taken such careful notes and reiterated back to them what, what the key problems are and stuff. Now they know you're going back to a team to solve their problem. Uh, they've already invested in you maybe an hour helping you understand their situation. Uh, when you come back, if you come back with a good proposal, you're almost definitely going to be accepted because besides the empathetic listening, they have just invested an hour with you and agreed to have you come in for another 30 or 60 minutes to explain your proposal. Well, they're not going to walk away from that investment of time if, the, if you make any decent proposal. Um, they're, going to, they're going to want to pursue this because they invested time in you and they invested energy, they invested their secrets with you, if you would, and they're going to accept it. And so even in the somewhat manipulative world of sales, this is an important, important thing to understand that you can approach it not with a hard sell, but with a diagnostic approach. Let me understand your situation. Let us solve your problem. Let us relieve your pain. And we're going to go get the, our best experts to come up with a proposal to relieve your pain, whatever that pain is. Again, that's metaphorically speaking um, in the case of, of business. Uh, I guess I'm going to end with this, and then we'll pick it up, like I say, when you get back from the break. When I bought my first newspaper when I was 25, uh, I was, I hope I didn't tell the story already, I don't think I did, but basically I felt like uh, I was begging for support from the community. It was a small, small town newspaper. It was my hometown where I'd grown up, gone to high school. Uh, I had already been a big city editor in Tampa, Florida, where we had 100,000 circulation. This one just had a small circulation, but it was an important stepping stone in my career to own my own newspaper and have to learn all aspects of the newspaper, which I had to do, and which was important in my future career. Um, but anyway, so I go in, into this uh, small town newspaper, basically buy it, and um, and everybody's acting like they're just that I'm a charity. They want a newspaper in their community, but they don't really think it's doing them any good. And so this bothered me. I didn't want to feel like a charity. As I started studying uh, sales and advertising more, because my background was mostly as a journalist at that point, I read about uh, an insurance uh, broker in uh, Carolina, North Carolina, who had stumbled on a key of advertising that I myself did not understand yet when I was 25. And that key to advertising was uh, this guy had, had worked in this city for, for uh, many years and he had bought advertising in the paper and he never felt like he got much good out of the advertising. And so um, he would buy it occasionally, but he would just hope that he would uh, at least make his money back. And that was his mo biggest hope was, I'm not losing money by buying advertising, he hoped. 
Uh, it's hard to understand the impact of advertising, uh, regardless. Uh, my brother happens to be in the insurance company. That's how he got rich. But his former partner did not understand advertising. My brother does understand advertising. His partner did not. So they finally had to split up because his partner didn't want to spend any money in advertising. And my brother knew that even though he couldn't decide always which was the best advertising medium he used, he knew that it was doing something. He couldn't measure it very well, though. But anyway, uh, going back to my story, this insurance guy in, in Carolina uh, decided he was going to try to expand his business by selling over the, over the mail and telephone, and that he was going to get a national mailing list for a specific product he, that he thought was a good product. And so he ordered from a national company a mailing list. Um, this was before email, so it wasn't an email list. It was a real mailing list. Um, and, and then he printed up a flyer that he was going to send out to everybody on this email list, or on this mail list, excuse me, postal mail list. And so he, uh, he went ahead and went to the newspaper and asked if they could print up the flyer, and they said yes, they would. So they printed up for him, uh, uh, if I remember right, is 40,000 flyers. Um, and then uh, um, he didn't receive his, his, uh, his mailing list. And so about that, after they were printed, the publisher called him up and said, look at it, we've got 40,000 flyers here. We can't keep them here. We don't have enough room to keep your stuff here. You need to come pick it up. And the insurance man said, well, I don't have any room either. He said, I'll tell you what, they, after they went back and forth a little bit, he finally said, look it, I will, let, let's put 20,000 in your newspaper. That's your circulation. Put 20,000 of the 40,000 in your newspaper I know I'm not going to make any money from it. I don't get that good a response, but just do it. And, and hopefully I'll get my mailing labels. And next week I'll pick yours up and mail them out to my mailing list. Well, he mailed out the first flyer. And just like he thought, he got a few phone calls. And at best, he kind of paid for the cost of, of sending out those flyers. Uh, but, you know, he didn't have much results. Just like before, all those years he'd been putting out, you know, he'd been advertising off and on, not much results. And so another week went by. Apparently this was a weekly newspaper. And so the publisher called him up again and said, look it, you need to come, it's been another week, you need to come pick up these, uh, these flyers. And he still didn't have mailing labels. And so he's, he's, he was exasperated. He said, okay, I don't know what to tell you. I don't have room for them. Just put these 20,000 in your newspaper again, same flyer, same people, same newspaper. I know I'm going to, not going to get anything out of this, but I will reprint when I get my mailing labels. I'm very exasperated. So he had the same flyers put into the same newspapers with the same subscribers. And what happened? The phone rang off the hook. He got way more response than he'd ever gotten before. Um, most people don't understand advertising. Uh, if you think about it in terms of a political candidate, no political candidate would ever think he's going to win election with one ad. Who would think that? You know, he'd be an idiot. And yet businesses think they can do that. They think that they're going to get a, this massive response with one ad when political candidates know they can't. And so what do we call it when a political candidate sets up a a full campaign, right? We call it a campaign. The key to advertising success is a campaign. Uh, the second time people will pay more attention and maybe they thought about it the first time when you advertise whatever product or service you had, they thought about it the first time, but then you know, it's a daily, you know, they, they put it aside, they lost the flyer. Um, and then the second time they got the same flyer, now there's several things that happen. One is, it reminds them, oh yeah, I was thinking about maybe I should call them. And so now it's fresh in their mind and they say, well, I lost the last flyer, better call them now uh, or I'll lose this flyer too. Um, and that also gives them a sense of more credibility. Now they've seen your flyer, your ad more than once. And so they're thinking, well, they're still advertising, still in business, so I guess they must be doing okay. Uh, we can trust them, I guess. So the more they see it, the more trust they have that it's legitimate. And so in this case, the insurance man made lots of money once he understood how to campaign. Once I understood how to campaign, I totally changed the nature of my advertising. And this is what I started offering. 
I, they'd been paying me the typical small town advertiser was typically buying like a one eighth page ad. Um, what I'd learned as a publisher now was that the paper and ink doesn't cost very much to me. What is the, the main expense for a newspaper is labor. And if I had to go out every week to resell ads to every individual, I would never do well because I'm taking too much labor to do that job. And so I went back, to the, I, I created this, uh, this uh, program. I said, look it, you occasionally buy a one-eighth page ad and you're not getting much results from it. I think you can do better if you do a campaign. And so I'm willing to uh, meet you halfway here. I will sell you ads as if you're buying a one-eighth page ad every week. You sign a contract so I know you're gonna take out an ad every week. You sign that contract and then what I will do is four times a year, instead of the eighth page ad, you get a full page ad. And four times a year, instead of that eighth page ad, you get a half page ad. And four times a year, instead of that, half page, uh, that eighth page ad, you get a quarter page ad. The rest of the time you get a one eighth page ad, but you also have limitless classified ads, reader ads, and you get four streamers to help promote your product four times a year too. Now that forced them to think about a campaign. So they've signed that contract, I doubled my revenue in my first year. I was able to sell for a very nice pro uh, profit after only two years uh, because I found it w wasn't really what I wanted to do long term. But I made a good profit after only two years because I, I had figured out how, how to help them. And so I had to understand where they were coming from before I could help them. And where they were coming from is they thought I was a charity, basically. And when I, in this case, it was a little bit different in that I had to understand not from them, but from somebody else that ads by themselves don't work. Individual ads don't work. So they were giving me a charity, but they weren't getting anything back from it. And so they had a good reason to be skeptical. And so I set up a system that they would, that would be a legitimate campaign a weekly ad, including big ads at no extra cost, and suddenly they discovered the importance of a campaign. Um, and so uh, this was very, very, very important in my career, uh, not just because I made some money and was able to go back and get my master's degree then with, with my profit, but also everybody saw me differently too. Uh, my, my professors saw me differently. Uh, they wanted all to do research with me because I was this successful professional already. Um, I, by the time I, after one year of doing my courses, I was hired to become the editor of a chain of newspapers. And a year later, the publisher of that chain of newspapers because I was seen differently. I was a successful publisher now. Uh, I had figured out I was more than just a journalist. I was now uh, somebody who understood the, the all aspects of the business. And so my whole life was changed by figuring out how to be a successful uh, publisher, not just a successful editor. Um, anyway, I'm gonna stop there, but again, just to emphasize uh, that this is really a key to success, not advertising, though that could be, but the whole idea of understanding somebody uh, and prescribing. Now, I, as a professional in this example, I was able to prescribe something because I had become an expert at least compared to them, uh, and, and I incentivized it so that they, it made sense to them. Suddenly they were getting a bunch of free space and I knew I was giving it to them and it really wasn't that expensive to me. Paper and ink wasn't expensive. It was my labor that was expensive. and I no longer had to sell, I just had to service. And as I was servicing, I could help them do better with their advertising because now I was in the service business, not the sales business which totally changed my relationship to those advertisers as well. So anyway, uh, thank you. And uh, we will call it quits for the day so I can get ready for this 90-minute uh, uh, workshop over the internet. And uh, have a good break. Come back energized and ready to go. Okay, thank you.